Okay, welcome to CE5670 uh, Geotechnical Engine Design Number Two. Um, this lecture we focus on talking about the design of our gravity walls. So the previous lecture we um, talk about the uh, background, the theoretical background for uh, Earth pressure. So now is uh, we apply it to design. Uh, we focus on talking about um, gravity walls, uh, the the design procedure. So by the of the end of this lecture. Um, students should able to know the overall design uh, procedure for the basic uh, uh, gravity walls. For gravity uh, walls, uh, first is the um, CIP cast in place uh, gr gravity wall on the left showing here. So this kind of wall is um, um, you have uh, uh, mass concrete, pretty much like um, the whole concept is uh, using the self weight of the uh, concrete uh, to resist um, the loading from the back size, which is uh, those uh, granular soil backfill. And um, this type of wall, um, you have some advantage. You can, um, first of all, like, you know, um, the good thing about it is. Um, you have total control of material because uh, you are designed for the concrete. So uh, pretty much this is uh, for both for the walls and backfill. So you have total control on on the material, which is good. Which you know uh, you can particular control on the drinkage. Uh, we talk about the drinkage, which is very important, and also. Uh, uh, you have uh, control that, uh, you know, make sure there's no organic matter, uh, organic stuff is bad um, because uh, you may call uh, corrosions and uh, uh, salmons and many like, you know, things that you want to uh, uh, get, uh, stay away from. So first of all, you can control the materials. And the other good thing about it is uh, this setup, uh, the mass concrete like a gravity wall, it can help you to. Uh, uh, you, you will be a good choice when you when you when you just use in conjunction with uh, deep foundations. So uh, for some offshore uh, or like a near shore uh, project, uh, when you have your uh, casting pace uh, uh, wall right there. And you can connect with uh, butter piles that like uh, you can go deep, so you, you will uh, help you to resist um, the loading. And you have your backfill right there. It helps you to uh, this type of uh, uh, gravity wall helps you to uh, connect with the deep foundations. So whenever you have a deep foundations, this this will be the way that you want to go. And last but not least is like uh, engineers has many many years of experience. Like uh, especially like uh, we learned from the old days uh, uh, on uh, those like uh, gravity wall designed. So it's just a very well established uh, procedure, design procedure, and also constructions uh, specifications. So it's a very well established method with a lot and a lot of experience uh, from the geotech side. Um, but the shortcoming for this type of wall, uh, you know, when you have like uh, like a huge uh, mass concrete right there. So where obviously, where obviously. Um, the disadvantage is being expensive because you are uh, utilizing a lot of uh, uh, exp expensive uh, uh, materials, uh, the concrete, um, and also this is it must be like a, a bottom up design, so which means uh, there's a lot of excavations and uh, and also like uh, you need to build like uh, from the bottoms to top, which costs you a lot of time. So with bottom up designed will be very expensive again 
And more importantly, time is money. It's very time consuming from this approach. And also because of the uh, material that like uh, you need to use and also uh, the construction method like this bottom up, which means that uh, you need to do the excavations and uh, you will have to uh, lateral cut that like a stand up uh, and you don't want to have uh, too steep of slope like uh, being stand up. Otherwise, you know, you, you cost more money to reinforce the, um, the cut. Uh, before you put on the mass concrete. So with all these limitations, uh, rule of thumb is uh, you limit uh, the height of the uh, of the wall. Uh, typically, uh, we don't design uh, for this type of uh, structure for more than three meters. Well, like, you know, for the case that you need like a deep foundations, you know, for those special projects, like, you know, you may have other exceptional case that you may want, you can go higher, you know, uh, the limitations over there is pretty much just, just a rule of thumb. And um, uh, for sure, like, you can overcome it if your budget allowed. You know, you can uh, stabilize your cut uh, with uh, saw now or, you know, uh, many uh, different techniques as long as you can, you know, your project like uh, can cover it. So, uh, but if you don't, if you, if for uh, a typical project, uh, the height of a gravity wall will not more than three meters. And the overall dimensions for this type of wall is also uh, dictated by the height. So the width of the foundations is typically is like 50 to 70% of the height that you're dealing with. So that is the uh, cast in place uh, gravity wall. Uh, we, we talk about all uh, uh, the limitations and uh, to uh, possibly like, you know, to, to improve it or, you know, uh, to get along uh, with some of this problem uh, is the design for the uh, cantic lever wall. So the cantic lever wall here, um, is kind of like a T shape, and uh, it, because of this T shape, uh, you minimize the material you need for the concrete, uh, which is nice because now um, um, part of it, pretty much like you know, it's kind of like you 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 uh, we take our portions of the uh, uh, casting paste wall, but like uh, this part of material here now becomes uh, earth material. So we are saving material, but like uh, you can use, you saving the expensive concrete and replace it with uh, 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 backfill materials, which like, you know, if you can find it uh, right on the site or near site, near your project site, then you can be quite cheap uh, as compared with uh, using concrete. So that's uh, the major, uh, the major uh, advantage of using the uh, cantilever wall is, you know, is, is much more econ economical, uh, which is important for many uh, typical uh, uh, retaining wall designs. Because if you walk around our urban area, you realize uh, we, there's a lot of uh, us, uh, retaining, retaining wall around our uh, neighborhood. And uh, many of them, like, you know, uh, the budget is tight. and uh, you know, saving your costs on those concrete material will, will be a huge plus. So uh, the cantilever wall is very popular and uh, you can see them like uh, everywhere uh, in urban uh, settings. Um, because of um, uh, uh, this uh, design that like, you know, you don't need like a massive concrete, typically this wall can go higher and uh, uh, the rule of thumb limitation is like a nine meters uh, for this kind of design. Um, and one thing uh, realize is um, uh, if you like look at the static of this, uh, you know, if you do your static, treat this like a static problem, so you realize you take the moment of all the false equilibrium, so you realize uh, uh, you need here, the point here is like, you know, where the moments, a lot of like uh, the moments uh, grow from. So uh, you, you, uh, for this kind of like a wall design, we need to make sure uh, at the connections at the T locations, we need uh, very strong re uh, reinforcements. Very strong reinforcements. 
So the structural side uh, of this design, so this is a geotech car, so we don't go into the structural design of retaining wall, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, as I was from, from the standpoint, from the understanding uh, from geotechnic engineering, it's like, uh, you know, all the earth retaining loading will force to uh, that point. So we there we need very strong uh, reinforcements. So uh, another like a uh, difference between the, this uh, cantilever wall versus the uh, the casting paste what we talk, uh, previously talked about, uh, the structural demand, the structural design of those wall will be more uh, uh, demanding, and I make sure like you know uh, the structural engineers they will do their jobs on uh, proper design in all the steel bar and uh, uh, use the correct size and also. Uh, resistant like uh, capability uh, for those structural components, and the width, uh, like the casting pace uh, gravity wall, the width of the uh, of the or the over dimensions uh, of the of the uh, cantilever wall is highly depends on the uh, the height of the uh, of the uh, retaining wall, and. Um, so this is like a cantilever wall, and there's other like a similar type of uh, um, a retaining wall. is is kind of like an a little bit more like an advanced versions of a cantil cantil a simple cantilever wall we are seeing here. And also like you know, for this lecture we will just uh, uh, focus on this type of design. Uh, but uh, for for future for for further informations, um, there's a more uh, ones on those like uh, type of wall, uh, uh, different type of it. Uh, first is the counter uh, fort wall, which like you know you have a little bit more support uh, on the wall. So th this is how the counter fort wall look like. You know he has uh, further uh, reinforcements uh, on th on the other sides of the wall, um, and also the uh, the, the bus stress wall. So again, it's like another like uh, reinforcements that like a uh, few are right there for the uh, wall to uh, further resist the uh, uh, backfield loading. And overall, uh, for those gravity wall designed uh, as a big picture, so some big picture design factors right there. Because uh, whenever we design for uh, those earth retaining structure, very important. Uh, always think about the water. It's water, water, and water. It's very important. Um, the locations of the water table. Be very aware of that. And when and we design for the wall, uh, the backfill materials usually uh, is. Uh, only restricted to granular uh, materials. So no wonder why, like, you know, those wanking and also a cooler method we talk about, uh, they only focus on uh, sandy materials. Uh, and part of it, why, like, you know, uh, the backfield materials always prefer um, our granular material is because uh, of the, the uh, drinkage issue. Because you don't want like a water pressure fill up behind your wall, and if you think about it, if you have a clay material like cohesive materials, uh, you would take forever for uh, compared with like granular materials. You take a, a much longer times uh, for drinkage to be happens. You can speed it up by using a wick drinks and all those matter, but you know. Uh, before we get into those complicated, uh, even more complicated, like geotech design, or more import, uh, more expensive uh, uh, constructions that you need, why don't you at the beginning uh, just uh, use granular uh, soil backfill materials so you take care of the drinkage? So we spend some time to talk about drinkage too in this lecture uh, for uh, retaining wall design, very important drinkage. And uh, to the draw um, the also like the uh, uh, for the uh, geological standpoint, uh, be very careful for your site. Any uh, weak simp 
um, both for the backfield, well, for backfield, most of it you can control it, but also like the foundation soils, uh, the soil underneath your retaining wall, uh, and the weak seam over there, we need to catch, uh, because if you have a weak soil layers underneath your, uh, your retaining wall, especially for those uh, a casting paste wall, you have a heavy concrete structure, then uh, now you're not only having uh, uh, over uh, turning moment problems uh, from the backfield, you know, you may have a bearing capacity issue uh, for your uh, uh, for your structure because pretty much this is now like a concrete structure. This is as uh, to some degree, you know, it's kind of like your shallow foundations. So if you have any weak soil layer, you may endanger uh, your retaining wall in the radar, like, you know, that will like bear capacity uh, failure. And also, like, uh, very important, the project criteria, which highly dictate uh, how high, how tall your wall uh, need to be. So the project criteria is not, uh, not I never forget about it. You know, you may uh, need to uh, uh, design for retaining wall that can resist, uh, you know, maybe like a uh, hundred years uh, a storm level. Uh, if you are, uh, you know, close to the water fund, uh, you, uh, you know, uh, uh, you may want to, you may need to be aware of like how tall the water you need, or like, you know, with simple simple cuts uh, for residential. Project, you know, for example, your house, you have a retaining wall that need to uh, by the hillside. Then you need to uh, know how tall uh, the wall that can withstand the, the cuts that are, uh, you know, for the project that you're working on. So those are the some of the project criteria need to be fully understand uh, before uh, doing any design of retaining wall structure. And last but not least, uh, yeah, uh, we briefly mentioned about it is the uh, backfill materials. Um, so the availability. Uh, backfill is also something you need to always uh, uh, be careful on or pay attention to, because very likely you have a cut, you take out take away, you know, take out the uh, excavate uh, and get rid of those uh, in situ soil. Uh, oftentimes, you, know, you may have organic matters or like uh, it is a cohesive, uh, it's a clay site. And pretty much like uh, you need to uh, get rid of those like in situ soils, but uh, backfill with granular materials. So where where are you going to get those like uh, backfill materials? If you can have a core that like a neoporter site, then you can get them cheap uh, cheaply, uh, more like a, uh, accessible to those material will significantly uh, reduce the cost for your project. So those are the um, some of the big kind of like a big picture design factors that you may want to think about before you do any uh, uh, details, engineering's like uh, calculations. And again, like uh, those are the uh, retaining wall design and uh, many uh, small size or like a mid size uh, geotech firms like uh, uh, focus on those uh, project. And I know it's like many engineers, uh, tutor engineers, uh, when they want to start up their own business, uh, you know, uh, they, they may want to go after like uh, those retaining wall uh, project. Because well, first of all, there's usually the size of those uh, projects are, uh, are relatively small compared with maybe you have like uh, other type of like uh, geotech project, uh, like uh, um, uh, high rise buildings, uh, not, not not even high rise, maybe like a residentials, like uh, apartment buildings, uh, versus like you know other uh, typical geotech project. But uh, those like a uh, retaining wall designs, you know, usually fall into fall into the categories of uh, small size project and uh, many uh, startup companies or so, like you know one or like uh, independent consultants like. Uh, want to get into uh, the geotech business uh, at the first steps. But like, you know, those, all those like uh, factors as a project engineers that you may want to think about. Okay, so here at this table, so the um, design steps or uh, design, overall design procedure for um, uh, retaining wall, uh, the CIP cast in place uh, gravity wall uh, designs. So it has 10 steps uh, overall recommended by the um, 
Federal Highway uh, Agency. Uh, the very first step here um, is to establish the uh, the project uh, requirements, uh, including uh, all the details, uh, the geometry, uh, external loading conditions, uh, and also performance criteria, construction constraints. So pretty much this is um, the part that like uh, more than geotech, you know, you need to take care of everything. Uh, what are the, the requirements for the agency and like for a particular job site, uh, you know, what are the, um, the limitations, the restraint that you have in terms of space and also uh, uh, like, you know, what the jobs require with dictates uh, the height of the wall and, you know, all those kind of things. Um, we go to step number one that you need to plan ahead. Uh, such that after step number one, pretty much you have a good uh, idea uh, how tall uh, the wall uh, that you need to design for. And the second step is uh, to you evaluate the site subsurface uh, conditions. Um, and also now is the part that uh, also like the typical geotech work you need to uh, perform, which is the site uh, investigations program uh, to do your geotech explorations. So this step where critical is like uh, you, you're able to, you need to identify the groundwater uh, tables, locations, and also con conditions. Uh, not only uh, at, the, at, the, at the moment that uh, you investigate the site, but you need to have an understanding uh, how the groundwater table uh, grow up and down uh, fluctuated throughout the year because uh, the design uh, the retaining wall that you design for likely you know uh, you have a lifespan of decades and uh, throughout uh, the year uh, uh, the groundwater tables uh, can can change uh, because of the rain seasons the rest season the dry seasons so we have an understanding uh, how the groundwater tables uh, uh, would change that very important too because uh, you don't uh, you don't want to design for the uh, dry season but like you know water is always a concern uh, especially for retaining water is uh, well, one of the most important factors is water water and water uh, so that's why at step number 10 you know we will uh, at the end of the design procedure uh, you need to think of the drain gauge conditions for the for the retaining wall so uh, again, like you want to know uh, throughout a year or throughout like, you know, uh, the lifespans uh, of the retaining wall, uh, uh, what kind of design criteria, you know, you are designing for. Maybe like, you know, you, you have, uh, uh, this is a particular uh, uh, near shore uh, retaining wall. Uh, you need to de design for uh, uh, part of the job uh, criteria is de designed for 25 years uh, storm uh, events so uh, you need to prepare for that so what is the groundwater table and this is also the the, uh, the step that uh, you would do the geotech uh, explorations uh, which could be the SPT and the CPT involved and soil sampling you know uh, whatever you need to establish the uh, geotech profile uh, not only like uh, for you know this is not only for the backfill but also for what underneath your retaining wall because uh, we'll learn this uh, later on when we talk about those uh, stability concern uh, retaining part of the retaining wall design will be like designed for shallow foundations you also want to know uh, what type of soil, what soils underneath it, and uh, and and this is also the the, the time that to catch any um, weak seam that you may have. So, for example, if you are designed for a retaining wall, um, so you am back in, in in the ground. So it's not just like at the bad field soils that you care about. But uh, you, you for sure you want to do your SPT or CPT uh, to investigate uh, the soil underneath your uh, retaining wall. 
because here this part is kind of like a shroud foundation. So we want to make sure uh, what kind of materials uh, the um, the you are retaining or sitting on. If it does kind of like a layer of a weak seam, you want to catch it. So if you have any weak seam layer, you want to catch it because again, uh, this uh, particular layer, if you have organic matter there, you will uh, affect the overall stability of your uh, uh, retaining wall. You don't want to have a failure like this uh, because of this weak, weak seam. And also if the soil that like are you sitting on is too weak, you may have uh, the classical uh, slip surface failure, uh, the bearing capacity type of failure. So, so that's why you want to do our ge uh, geotech explorations program uh, to understand what kind of like a soil you're dealing with. So that's step number two. And step number three after that, then you will uh, you need to come out with the soil and rock parameters, uh, so such that you can do uh, your decide later on. So, pretty much like you know, uh, this part, or like from step one to step three, you know, after that you have a pretty good idea of like uh, how tall, like uh, so. Step one, step three, give you the uh, the raw height. You know, like, uh, and also a portrait criteria based on portrait criteria. So, you have a pretty good understanding on the, uh, the dimensions of the wall you need to design for. And um, this is not like uh, finalized yet, even though, like, you know, you know, like uh, the wall that you design for need to sustain like a 10 meter of, of, of a backfill or like a six meter of a backfill uh, in order to get the job done. But you like uh, the base of the wall, you know, that kind of things. And also like maybe um, how much rebar you get in, the thickness of the wall, uh, those uh, uh, details uh, you still need to finalize uh, based on uh, later on steps when you look at the bearing capacity of the wall and also the other stability concern like a slipping or uh, overturning. Uh, uh, issue. We will talk about that. Um, so after step one to step three, and then step four, uh, this is where we just talk about. Then like uh, you will select the initial base dimensions of the wall, and um, uh, again, like you know, the base dimensions that you select here is subjected to change based on step five to step seven. We'll get there, but uh, this base here is uh, when you select this is a functions of the height so uh of the wall so based on like uh some uh typical criteria or like what from like kind of like a uh a design guidelines to start with so you know like how tall based on the job criteria uh the, the height of the wall then you have a good understanding or good like a number uh what from to start a uh, range over there, two over five uh, uh, to two over three uh, of the uh, height of the wall to start with. And then you will uh, pick a number of the width of the wall. And then later on, uh, you know, based on the later on steps to finalize uh, uh, the minimal width, because you want to save cost, which means save material there. You don't want to overdo it, you know. If uh, if two over five height can uh, can do it, you don't want to uh, make it as wide as become like uh, three over five. If this is if this can do it, you don't want to uh, over design it. But uh, you know, this need to be confirmed uh, based on later uh, analysis. So that will be step number four. Uh, Get you start, uh, have an initial base dimensions, and then confirm it later. And step five uh, will be the select the lateral uh, earth pressure distributions, uh, and also like you know uh, look at other uh, issues like the surcharge that you may have. Um, uh, is this wall like a freely drained 
Uh, hopefully it is, then you don't need to worry about the hydrostatic water pressure. But like, you know, uh, in some case that, you know, uh, uh, it's too expensive to get all freely drink materials. You know, you, you need to mix your backfill material with certain type, uh, certain percentage, maybe like a 50%, I think design criteria is uh, yeah, so this is like uh, our recommendations, this table is the recommendations of, of the uh, uh, freeway, uh, highway uh, authorities uh, agency recommend uh, for the uh, backfill materials gradations. So they allow uh, no more than 15% of fine materials. So, uh, you know, you, the, ideal, the, the most ideal case is like you get backfill materials that uh, uh, like a freely drink, so more more kind of like a gravel lights, even not like a sand materials. Uh, but you will be maybe too expensive to get those uh, 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 soil or sand or gravel to your job site if they're not like uh, near nearby available. And sometimes like you know you need to uh, balance the cost, so that's why you know there's a lot of like uh, experience and uh, money calculations going on in this business. So if you uh, from the project management standpoint, it's like uh, you you find out the cost the cost optimal uh, optimal uh, optimal's point is uh, optimizations is uh, having ten percent of fine materials, then like you know uh, under with an understanding that uh, those fine materials uh, could retain water, and then you may want to uh, uh, lo at least look at uh, the hydrostatic pressure water pressure. Uh, you know, that may uh, end up like uh, reduce uh, or increase or increase the uh, earth pressure uh, to your wall. So all those need to balance out, you know, if the money trade off that you can, uh, you can sustain a certain percent of uh, fine material, 10%, 7%, like, you know, you may want to go off it, go for that because of the cost uh, concerned. Anyways, so step five is the one that like a uh, fine tuning uh, all the uh, different kind of loadings uh, when you uh, building up your lateral earth pressure distributions uh, diagram for your wall. Uh, you know, water pressure is very important that you cannot ignore. Surcharge, like you know, you need to be uh, be aware of. So if if the wall that you are, you are designing is is has a uh, loading behind uh, the wall, then that will be the surcharge that you want, you need to account for. Um, and also uh, in California, you need to uh, worry about the seismic uh, demand, the seismic loading. So part of it, you need to uh, uh, think about it too. So those are step five. And step six is the uh, uh, bearing capacity. Uh, step six, uh, seven, and um, eight. So those three steps, uh, we will talk about it uh, in this lecture in later slides. So uh, we will go into details, uh, seven, eight, and nine. And uh, step number nine, uh, nine is the settlements. Uh, because like uh, you are, you have the backfill right there, and then you also have the surcharge, and also you have the weight, uh, which is uh, the concrete of the uh, of the retaining wall. So end up what happens is since you're loading on the ground. So that's why like a uh, 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 step number two and three, you we need you need to uh, do a geotech explanations to uh, to find out what soils or the compressibility. So if you have a CPT SPT, you can correlate that uh, with the C sub C, the compression index of soils. Or you uh, take a, a samples if it's a uh, cohesive material, you better like uh, do a soil sampling. Uh, you know, uh, uh, collect the soil sample, ship ship it to the lab, and then uh, conduct a consolidation test. Then you can get the compressibility uh, index or compressibility information of the soils, so that you can perform a settlements uh, analysis. Uh, make sure the um, uh, the settlements of the soil is within the tolerance level for uh, for your for the criteria for your job, and uh, more complicated is um, we talk about uh, the the stress distributions uh, along the base uh, of your 
of your uh, uh, retaining wall. So, oops. So, if this is your retaining wall, uh, the stress distributions, oops, in fact, is uh, non-linear. It's more like a to the toe to, uh, to the to the uh, to the heel. So, uh, because of this, you have a non-linear. Uh, sorry, like a yeah, non like a straight line or non like horizontal line stress distributions. Uh, you will have uh, defensive settlements, so there will be more settlements like uh, at higher stress than the lower stress. So and uh, like um, in long term, uh, the uh, retaining wall, and also you have the backfield saw here pushing the uh, the wall go this way. So we would expect uh, the whole wall will tilt a little bit. We tilt toward uh, uh, the the other side of, of, of from the backfield. So that's why, like, uh, uh, we need to estimate uh, the lateral wall movement, the tilting, um, and the wall settlements. The wall settlements are likely some defensive settlements. So we need to check that. Uh, that's a step number nine. And um, uh, some design guideline is um, for uh, the uh, retaining wall um, settlements in general is you will move. And then like, uh, you know, uh, uh, wall thumb is like uh, you can take one inch settlements. If your uh, calculations, settlements calculations, find the uh, of our settlements at uh, uh, within the uh, the time span of your uh, retaining wall, you know, you design uh, the retaining wall have a ten years or uh, or fifty years of lifespan. You need to make sure, like within the fifteen years, the overall settlements with less than one inch. And for tilting, uh, the acceptable level for tilting. Is one over five hundred. So uh, this ratio here is equals to the uh, defensive settlements. Do I by the horizontal distance? So. Uh, so defensive settlements is like uh, so. If here is def uh, defensive, it's is settling this much, and here is the uh, the other side is settling less. So this distance here would be your defensive settlements, and this defensive settlements normalized by uh, this two points. So this is your horizontal distance. So this ratio is uh, is recommended to be less than one over five hundred. So those are kind of like the wolf thumb that uh, for our settlements uh, criteria. But like you know, this is just wolf thumb. Like uh, if you have like a, a particular job, if they spell spell out the criteria either by like you know um, by the design guidelines or, or any like a uh, design code. That, like uh, they follow within the state or within the uh, Caltrain, like uh, for example, Caltrain requirements. Or you know, if you're Texas tech stock, they have uh, their own like as uh, criteria in terms of settlements. Like you know, all those you need to pay attention to. So that's why, like you know, uh, getting the parameters of the soils is very important because the real life student realized you know it dictate uh, a lot of those like uh, settlements criteria. So, um, so we care about those tilting and defensive settlements, um, and you know you, sometimes it be complicate uh, a little bit more complicated on from those issues as we mentioned because uh, we have a non-linear or like a non like a, a uniform uh, settlements along the uh, the uh, retaining wall bottom part of it. So uh, if we find out like. Uh, that's too much settlements. Uh, that's a couple of things like uh, we can do uh, first. So if settlements is too much, 
so too large. There's a couple of things we can do. Uh, first, we change the dimensions. We change the width, uh, the the width uh, of the uh, the retaining wall. So that's why, like at step number four, we say this is uh, we design. Uh, firstly, design just based on the uh, initial base. So uh, anything goes wrong from step five to step nine. For example, now like you know our initial space like a dimensions, you good from uh, you good for the uh, uh, the the bearing capacity capacity the overturnings and you know whatever from five step five to step eight. But now uh, the, the the current dimensions uh, end up like a result in too much of settlements. Now, like you know, you may want to go back to change uh, the the dimensions. Uh, you know, make the your foundation your your foundation a bit wider, and then like you know, uh, we do the whole steps, design step from four from uh, from uh, step four to step nine. See whether this time with a larger dimensions or with, with a larger base, hopefully you will reduce the settlements. So that's that's the design like uh, iteration iterations you need to go through. So another thing like uh, you you can change is like uh, using maybe because now the whole thing is too heavy. Uh, you don't want to change the concrete. You don't want to change the uh, the dimension of the base. But what you can do is uh, maybe uh, use some a uh, little bit more lightweight backfill. That may help. Because now you are using like a less uh, heavy, it's more lighter uh, uh, backfill material, so you will be reducing the the loading on the uh, subgrade soil, so it may help you to reduce the settlements. Well, last but not least, like uh, you change your wall type, uh, to design wall design, or like you know, uh, use the foundations in conjunction with the uh, the retaining wall. So some some like a designed um, of retaining wall is allowed it to a particular the gravity wall that we mentioned about is uh, you can adding piles to your to your uh, uh, cast in place uh, retaining wall. So in that case, like you know, uh, you bypass the loading uh, through the soft soil layers and then like uh, the load. Uh, the loading directly go to the, the uh, therm uh, or like a more uh, stiff soil layers, and it helps you to uh, to minimize the uh, the settlement issue. So that's pretty much just the step number nine uh, for the uh, our uh, design steps. And step number ten would be like uh, the design the wall drainage systems, and we'll spend a little bit more times uh, on that uh, when we get there. So uh, this this is pretty much the overall picture, uh, what you need to do uh, when you design for retaining wall. And uh, for some of them, um, uh, step six, step six is, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, from step five to step eight, we we'll spend a little more time to, to discuss. Okay, so here, so two pictures of the, um, cantilever walls and on, on the left hand side the dump demonstrate the uh, different terminologies uh, of different components uh, for for the wall and um, at the uh, footings of the wall uh, left hand side to the stump or the uh, the wall is called we call the toe part and uh, whatever right hand side or at the back field side here we call it as the heel, and it also shows you like uh, the structural components, uh, the reinforcements that we need, uh, the V bar, and also the uh, um, the bars that connect the different components. A particular importance, uh, you know, we need strong uh, reinforcements at the connections between the footings and the stamp, uh, where um, we expect a great um, moment force uh, uh, from the backfill, uh, from the backfill materials. And also like, you know, um, we call like uh, 
on the uh, the other side of the retaining wall, uh, uh, opposite to the backfield, is uh, the embankment part of it, um, and any loading that uh, is above the fields or uh, the surcharge, and uh, you can uh, uh, for the retaining wall. Uh, oftentimes, you can also uh, deal with uh, a sloping angle right there. And the height uh, for the for the uh, for the wall that can uh, sustain the backfield height. And on the right hand side of the uh, of the uh, of the figures of uh, uh, this slide, is uh, try to uh, break down the different uh, forces that uh, we can expect. Uh, when we uh, do the design or do the analysis for retaining wall, um, and you show you different like our forces um, from the uh, weight that we expect from different components, um, and also the uh, the pass pressure that uh, given to the wall uh, at the uh, embank uh, embankment size. Uh, of the wall and also the uh, the backfield force and also the surcharge uh, force uh, that given as to the wall and uh, the uh, the soils that above the uh, the hill size uh, of the footings right here in general we consider this as part of the wall systems right there actually this part too. So this part of soils or backfill is helping to stabilize the wall. So the weight uh, over there is also uh, adding on the footing of the uh, foundations. And uh, we will consider that, that part of the soils that also contribute to the settlements or the uh, uh, bearing capacity that we need to look at uh, when we uh, design for the retaining wall. Um, and realize uh, the the reaction force uh, underneath the the footings. You will be uh, unevenly distributed. So the reaction force that are uh, adding at the base uh, of the footings, you will have an offset. And uh, for for further. Analysis when we talk about the uh, overturning moments and also the uh, the sliding um, issue of uh, of those gravity walls, finding this offset or eccentricity will be will be necessary, and there's some also requirements uh, for those uh, uh, locations of the reaction force. Uh, we'll talk about this in um, uh, further uh, extend information in uh, later slides. And one more uh, important point is that when we design for a retaining wall, uh, oftentimes uh, this part of soil here, we may not want to count on uh, helping to stabilize the wall. Um, so sometimes, like at this pass pressure, this part, uh, you know, even though like uh, you may temporarily uh, exist over there. But like uh, we don't we don't count on the benefit getting from this pass pressure, because uh, uh, throughout the lifespan of um, of the wall, we cannot guarantee this part of soils uh, is always be there because of weathering, because of uh, other construction issue, or like you know uh, other reasons. Uh, we cannot guarantee uh, the soils will stay there forever. So. Uh, I feel the lifespan of the uh, of the gravity wall, so that's why, like you know, uh, this part of soils, uh, we we may not want to uh, count on uh, it being there to provide the uh, uh, the the loading to help to stabilizing the wall. Okay, so now uh, we are at step number five. Uh, remember, like uh, we have uh, ten steps uh, procedure uh, when designing for gravity wall uh, in general, um, 
and step number five is uh, determining the uh, lateral pressure distributions. So here is uh, 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 a page uh, from the FHWA, uh, the Federal uh, Highway Authorities Manual. Um, and it showed you different type of rules and like uh, some uh, generalized uh, distributed uh, earth, uh, lateral earth pressure or in general pressure uh, uh, distributed diagrams uh, both uh, behind the wall from the backfield and also underneath the footing uh, from the response of uh, uh, from the uh, subgrade soil. Um, so uh, the first one is the gravity walls uh, and then uh, uh, the middle one is uh, cantilever walls uh, that like are widely used uh, nowadays uh, for simple uh, gravity wall settings and also uh, uh, beneath this uh, is the counter fort wall and on the right hand side you know uh, he shows you some definitions on the terms or the symbols they use uh, on the diagram so the b stands for the width uh, uh, of the base of the footings and this friction angle here tangents uh, uh, delta sub b is the frictions between the soil and the base. So pretty much is uh, describing the frictions at the bottom. So it kind of like prevent um, the gravity wall from sliding because uh, you have a uh, concrete like a slab, then like you know, like a smooth surface, and the frictions is pretty much provided by the uh, by the soil. Because now it's not soil to soil. So if uh, remember, like your direct shear test, so when you're testing on sand, uh, you're forcing the uh, sand sliding again the sand. But now it's pretty much is um, is your soil sliding around the uh, against uh, the structure, uh, where likely it's uh, the concrete. So um, for this uh, angle, so this angle here now is the uh, interactions between soil and um, concrete or other material. And um, what what numbers is it? Um, NAFAX, the uh, Navy Design Manual, uh, 1986. So the uh, what we call DM seven point oh two, we uh, the soil mechanic is seven point oh one, and uh, for the uh, foundation design and other like a simple geotech design is as uh, uh, DM seven point oh two, and seven point oh three uh, more advanced topic like uh, uh, seismic designs. Uh, so uh, from this uh, Navy the DM uh, seven point oh two, uh, it has a recommended number. So uh, between steel and soil, you recommend uh, friction angles of uh, 20 degree. So you can uh, expect it will be less than soil to soil. Uh, remember like uh, your direct shear test, uh, you, when we're testing against sand, depends on sand, it uh, depends on the density. We got like a degree um, friction angles uh, in a range of about 30 to 40 degrees. So that you can expect that just like on sand, and for um, um, soil on on like a smooth smooth surface like a steel, uh, there's like 1986 reference uh, recommend 20 degrees, and for concrete and timber, so again uh, depends on what type of. Uh, uh, material you have for your uh, retaining wall. It could be timber, it could be steel, but very likely it's just concrete. Um, the interactions angles is equals to uh, 3 over 4 to the friction, uh, soil friction angle. So here, this one is the soil friction angle. So uh, since like you know the concrete have a smooth uh, surface so now uh, it's just a portion of it 
uh, a three over four times the soil friction angle, and the soil friction angle is from the subgrade soil. So this is the soil friction angles, uh, the soil where the foundation is sitting on. So those are the recommended values based on this reference, uh, DM 7.02, which is from 1986. Uh, for sure, like, you know, um, there's many other like a reference available now. Um, and, you know, uh, when you do a design, uh, make sure like, you know, you cite uh, where you get a reference. If, uh, if you like, you know, uh, a couple of years later, like uh, the, uh, federal highway authorities, they have their own recommendations on the newer versions of uh, the site guidelines, then like, you know, you may want to uh, use them, but just like a DM7 and O2, you know, is a good start. Uh, as a very simple uh, reference that we can, uh, we can use for now. So those, that is the uh, friction angles uh, between the saw and the base, and the W right there is uh, the weight um, of your wall, and uh, C here, so there's two cohesions. Uh, the first one is the uh, cohesions of uh, foundation soils. So this is a soil strength parameters. And um, C sub A here, they call it uh, the adhesions of concrete on soil. So this is uh, more like a, a soil and clay interface right there. And uh, the delta right there is the angle of uh, wall frictions and P sub P is the uh, passive pressure. <coughs> and <coughs> uh, uh, later on, uh, use this menu also provide many different formulas uh, like um, the finding the eccentricity that we mentioned. So, well, again, um, when you look at those uh, stress distributions uh, underneath the footings, they are always have an offset. And just um, because it's like uh, you got the loading uh, adding on the on the wall, so the wall tend to rotate that way or tend to tilt like, you know, toward the, the toe of the uh, wall. So that's why uh, at this part of the wall, you always have a greater uh, stress distributions. So this is a eccentric uh, loading, you know, back to our shallow foundation design, when we have a uh, eccentric like a loading, uh, this will be uh, more complicated uh, when we find the bearing uh, pressure. And <clears throat> again, like uh, uh, when we do a retaining wall design, it, it is a little bit like a continuous, uh, Travel foundations, so uh, so that's why later on we also need to find out the bearing pressure. So this part of the formula is uh, the bearing pressure. It's like the shallow foundations, but now it's a reading in wall. But and this formula here is pretty much based on the uh, the distributed the uh, non-uniform distributed stress at the at the base. Uh, this is find the eccentricity. Uh, so if this is like an offset and now you have uh, the center right here the center line right there and form the uh, the center of the uh, distributed stress uh, to the center of the wall here this is the the e right there uh, eccentricity um, and then like uh, you will find that based on uh, like there's like a distant D, and this distant D pretty much is like a, when we take the moment. Um, so it's gonna be messy here. So this is, for example, this is uh, my footings, right? And we will take moment at the uh, at the toe point, at the uh, far left of the toe point. So we take moment, for example, this is a point eight. Um, we take moment uh, up to this point, and we know this is uh the reaction force let's say uh from the base uh based on the distributed stress at the base of the footings and this is the center line so this part is the distant d that it described here so it's by taking moment at the about the toe and this part here is the uh eccentricity the e right there 
So that's, that's the formula for that. And later on, it's also give you some formulas for the factor of safety and also the formulas uh, against sliding. We'll talk about more uh, on those uh, overturning and sliding in more details and so as the bearing pressure. So it's nice that like, uh, be careful, it's nice that here give you all this formula, oops, all these formulas, uh, but be very careful when you use those formulas because uh, Everything does tie back to basic static or physics that we learned uh, in our engineering class. And those firm formulas works for like a particular uh, simplified law, like the most simple form of, uh, of the geometry of the wall. And uh, <laughs> I, I won't count on so formula unless like, you know, I uh, draw the free body diagrams and like, you know, actually do the, uh, the moment, take a moment and also uh, uh, do the equilibrium of forces, both x and y directions. Uh, to verify, like you know, those formulas, because you know those formulas again like work uh, at a simple case, but like you know, for a job, you know, if you have an extra surcharge or you have, a, uh, you know, for example, you need to count on the uh, the piece of P uh, that provided by the tow side of the wall, uh, because like uh, your the foundations or uh, the your footings of the uh, retaining wall is deep enough for you to consider that, or like you know. And now you need to consider the hydrostatic water pressure because all this is a simplified form that they didn't consider the effect of the water. Uh, then like those formula, like you know, it won't work. So you know, uh, don't don't just try to uh, pull out the the cookbook and then uh, you know believe in the formulas. Uh, you know, again, like you know, we're engineers. Uh, those formulas like work for a particular case uh, may not be for your. Uh, your job because your project because uh, from project to project from job site to job site uh, you know uh, every project has this unique uh, criteria that you need to pay attention okay we mentioned about the bearing pressure um, for calculating uh, at the base of your uh, retaining wall as if uh, shroud foundations are right there uh, and because this is a uh, 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 a non-uniform distributed stress, you know, hopefully it helps you to be in mind what we have learned in C467. Uh, when we design for our shallow foundations uh, under uh, uh, an uh, eccentric loading, or you have a moment applied to your uh, shallow foundations, it will result in a non-uniform distributed stress. And to calculate the um, the bearing pressure, um, then we come up with those formula right there. So it will be the same thing, uh, the same formulas that uh, pretty much we use uh, in our um, in our uh, retaining wall design as if a shroud foundations. Uh, the major difference now is like we don't have uh, uh, water pressure in most cases, but if you have a hydrostatic uh, pressure because like your backfill materials are contain fines or like you know you design for a special uh, condition that uh, there will be a more uh, momentary water table then uh, you will have this hydrostatic water pressure but anyways in general it's like uh, uh, you may not have you very likely you don't have the water pressure and pretty much this is the same formulas uh, calculating the, the maximum uh, where uh, more likely we, we design for the maximum stress right there. And also uh, we can able to find out the minimum stress uh, with this formula. But this formula is you need to find out the uh, eccentricity. And uh, uh, the weight of the concrete, uh, the weight of the retaining wall, the same thing. And now does like a vertical loading that we have in uh, foundation design. Uh, now is the vertical component uh, where we design for or where we ca calculate from uh, the vertical uh, stress uh, from a uh, vertical loading from the backfill because uh, it come with like an angles, right? Uh, uh, the because you have frictions uh, right there between the um, the angle of wall frictions, so that's why you have uh, uh, come with an angles go into your wall, and you uh, you know the uh, wall frictions, um, then uh, you can 
uh, break it into the vertical part and also the horizontal part. And the vertical part here will contribute, uh, add uh, to the bearing pressure at the base of your uh, uh, footings. So those are the bearing uh, pressure uh, formula uh, for, for finding the bearing pressure calculations. So how about the bearing capacity? So uh, again, uh, this go back to C467, a really important concept. You know, when we calculate the factor of safety against the uh, uh, the uh, the failures of the uh, or the bearing capacity uh, uh, failure, uh, it is again, it is the resistance over the loading, right? So the the resistance require bearing capacity. And the loading is the bearing pressure. So, so this is kind of like the resistance or soil resistance. So it depends on how strong the soil is uh, uh, on the subgrade. And the bearing pressure pretty much is the uh, loading demand. So the loading from war. From the retaining wall. So the loading comes from two parts, right? First is the uh, the weight uh, or the concrete weight plus the backfield weight. And then the second one, like the backfield weight means uh, uh, the weight uh, on the footing, right? Because this part is uh, this, this part of the, uh, the, the cantilever wall systems. And then like uh, you have the loading from the backfield pressure. So now this, we talk about the pressure from this part of the backfield. So that's the second part of it. And uh, for finding the bearing capacity here in C467, it's like uh, we I mentioned about this the two method, uh, the Tesaki bearing uh, capacity and also the vertex uh, uh, bearing uh, capacity method. So the Tesaki. 1943 method or the uh, or the rustic bearing capacity method uh, 1974 and 1975 procedures and I because you have a eccentric loading for our retaining wall design uh, very likely you will need the oops you will need the rotting method. The Tosaki method you has like uh, its limitations, um, and a vertex method is more uh, flexible. It's a bit like more complicated than a longer design procedure, but uh, it allows you to take care of the eccentric loadings and also the uh, non-uniform distributed stress. So, uh, for more information, we don't have time to to repeat all that. Uh, you can. Go back to your C467 uh, notes or like the Caputo textbook uh, when, uh, where we talk about the shell foundations. So um, the formulas that provided by the, uh, by the, uh, 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 the Federal Highway Agency uh, manual is this one. So that is the soil capacity. Uh, so soil, uh, soil bearing capacity uh, former calculations. And uh, one part that, uh, yeah, talk about the uh, soil unit weight. So when, when we calculate the soil unit weight, uh, it depends on the locations of the water table. And uh, we, we talk about that in C467 here. Um, so that's like a different cases. Uh, if the water table is high, 
pretty much like you know you locate at uh your you know because uh, you have control on the back feel you want to keep it dry by doing it design but uh at the footing part uh, since uh you will be good go into your sub gray soils and the groundwater table locations is some something that like you know uh it's harder to control and for the case that like you, know, you have a ground a high groundwater table and um high enough that like you know reaching your footings then pretty much your uh unit weight uh is a uh, submerge uh unit weight is an effective unit weight so you have the soil unit weight minus the um the water unit weight that is your effective unit weight or the other cases is your groundwater table is a uh this deep enough that uh, there's a greater depth that uh, the, the, uh, is equals to um, is far deep enough that uh, is greater than like uh, one dimensions one uh, one width dive uh, foundation width. Uh, Dimensions like uh, below the uh, your initial grade, uh, past the depth of the uh, uh, footings of the foundation footings. Then, if it is uh, that uh, deep, then pretty much your effective unit weight is equals to the total unit weight of the soils, which means the water has no effect on the unit weight of the soils. But if it is something in between, like in between the depth of the footings, like uh, versus like uh, 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 one more like uh, uh, width of the foundation deep, then if it is something in between, um, in between here and in between there, that's where the water table located at. Then pretty much you need to calculate uh, the air waged. Uh, Unit weight based on this formula. So that's how we calculate the what we call the effective unit weight based on the locations of the uh, groundwater table. So effective soil unit weight. So that's uh, how we calculate the uh, the bearing capacity of uh, of soils um, and the bearing pressure is uh, we can use a uh, formula right here. So that is your uh, bearing pressure. But for the bearing capacity, so for a bearing capacity, uh, we use uh, the soil bearing capacity formulas. And um, to uh, help you, you know, uh, to further like uh, review this, I highly recommend you to go back to C four six seven or like in your your undergrad undergrad uh, foundation textbook. Uh, you know we call like the Tosaki bearing. So for example, this is the Tosaki bearing capacity formulas, um, and uh, be be aware of all the uh, limitations that he has because like uh, this method cannot uh, apply uh, take care of the moment load and uh, also like. Uh, uh, the inclined and uh, loading, you know, you cannot take care of. So you know, it has a lot. Of, a lot. This is a, a, a more simplified approach, and it has like a, a bunch of uh, limitations. So I uh, highly recommend you to go back to reviews like uh, the versus uh, bearing capacity uh, calculations uh, uh, when you do your foundation uh, design uh, in the you know uh, as part of the uh, the retaining wall designs. Because again, like uh, where we design for the bearing capacity failure, uh, the bottom part of the wall is like a shallow, shallow foundations. Okay, in effect, uh, per the FHWA, the Federal Highway Agency, is uh, for uh, bearing capacity designed uh, in retaining wall. It requires to have at least a factor of safety or at least three. So that's that's the requirement um, for bearing capacity. Next is the uh, the issue of uh, overturning and sliding. Um, well, first uh, for overturning, so uh, 
when uh, the uh, there's a like you know like that the uh, the backfill the loading from the backfill is large enough uh, you uh, the whole thing uh, the the retaining wall could rotate uh, hinging at the at the toe uh, and then like you know uh, the whole thing overturns and then it fails. Uh, and for FHWA, uh, it has uh, two different uh, requirements based on the uh, conditions or the, the type of uh, uh, materials underneath the footing, would that be soil or rock uh, for overturning? Um, FHWA requires that uh, the factor of safety need to be greater than two. That is for soil. So if your retaining wall is founding on soil, uh, the factor of safety must be uh, greater than or equal to two per FHWA. Um, for for rock site, uh, is a little bit more forgiving. So it allows a factor of of safety uh, of at least one point five. And the calculations of those like a factor of safety is based on uh, taking moment. Uh, in reference of the at the toe uh, point A right there, and we will do some examples at the end. We will do examples at the end to show you how to do those like uh, overturning uh, moment calculations. So that's um, first requirement. The second requirements uh, for for in this uh, subject is uh, when we select the dimensions of the uh, well, it's our, our combinations of a couple of things like uh, dimensions and also uh, the, the, uh, the overall design, you know, you include the dimensions of the retaining wall and also the backfill materials. And uh, on top of that is the type of a wall, like, you know, it could be uh, uh, the, the, the traditional cast in place kind of like gravity walls or uh, cantilever walls or like, you know, a cantilever walls with anchor. So type of wall, like dimensions, and also uh, uh, type of backfill, the weight of the backfill uh, materials uh, would uh, uh, end up result in uh, a reaction force that take place like uh, underneath the footings. And uh, the locations of this uh, force will dictate uh, the overturning moment. So that's why, uh, the locations of this resultant force is very important. And per the uh, FHWAE uh, has different requirements. So, um, so if this is the center line, so the, uh, the offset the locations of this uh, resulting force, we call this the eccentricity. So um, for soil, FHWA require that this uh, eccentricity need to be less than or equals uh, the width of the uh, foundations over six. So the width of the foundations here is with a dimensions B. So uh, for soils, uh, the resulting resultant force require that again, like uh, you know, at the base of the foundations need to be uh, like you know, at a distance that is smaller than a six of the uh, from the center line of the retaining wall. For rock, which again is a bit more forgiving, so the uh, eccentricities is need to be less than a b over four. So that's another requirements, and uh, we will do an examples um, at the end of this lecture. You will better help you to demonstrate, you know, how to. Uh, take the moments to find out those uh, eccentricities, and again, like uh, if 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 you end up this e is like uh, greater than the requirements, then you will be iter iterative uh, process. Then the engineers need to go back to the design and change uh, the dimensions of the uh, footings, uh, or like you know, uh, uh, reduce the weight of the uh, backfill. So using lightweight uh, backfill material, or like, you know, uh, if, if those things doesn't work, then you may need to think of alternative uh, 
<laughs> uh, different word type, or maybe you know you need to have a deep foundations in conjunction with the uh, cast in place uh, gravity walls. So that is the overlook overview of the uh, the overview of the overturning issue. Um, next is the sli sliding. So again, like if the uh, backfill materials is too heavy, uh, you know you could be like a uh, you know, forcing the uh, the the structure, which is the retaining wall, to slide, and to prevent the sliding, uh, you know, there's like a frictional force underneath the uh, foundations uh, you know, to prevent the slides, or like you know, you have uh, maximum some uh, embankment soil right there uh, at the other side of the wall to provide a passive uh, pressure. Uh, to to prevent the, the water from sliding, so those are the uh, the force to help you to against like you know uh, the sliding failure to be happens, um, and to describe uh, the frictional force at the interface at the bottom, uh, we use our friction angles of delta B. We kind of like a uh, a little bit like I mentions about it. So this is the friction angle uh, in the interactions. Angle between the uh, the the base of the footing and the soil, um, and F H W A the uh, Federal Highway Agency uh, requires that the factor of safety for sliding, the factor of safety is need to be greater than uh, one point five at least, and to calculate um, the the frictional force right there, or the force that like uh, prevents sliding to happen, um, is based on the soil type. Uh, more obvious is uh, I mean the soil type. So this picture here uh, gives you the force. Uh, summarize the force uh, that adding on the uh, the base of the wall, um, and it has a shear lock. So this is a shear lock to prevent. Uh, the sliding, you know, um, if if like you end up like your your, your uh, uh, if you have a flat uh, retaining wall and end up like the factor of safety is is less than one point five, then you may want to think of like a design that um, that has a shear lock here that helps you to um, to prevent the sliding. So the force adding on the base again is the uh, vertical force uh, from the backfield to piece of V right there and the uh, um, and also, you have a uh, maximum pass pressure that go from the uh, the embankment side to prevent the sliding. Um, and this is again, this is the force that helps you to uh, to against the uh, um, the sliding. And this is the force that uh, pushing the the uh, the the structure to slide. So this is the driving force. Right there, and this F and this uh, piece of P are the resistant force that prevent the sliding. And for granular soils, so if you have a sand uh, material, so for this, because this is just our work on the sliding, so we only care about the soils, or like you know, we only focus on the soil that underneath the uh, the base of the uh, foundations or the base of the footings. Um, and for granular soils, uh, that okay right there. So the force that um, against the sliding, uh, let's say capital force. Um, let's say it's a small f here. So this is the resistant force will be equals to. Um, the vertical loading, which is the rate uh, plus the vertical load. So those vertical loading right there, it's kind of like uh, if we, we redo our sum of uh, equilibrium force in the vertical directions, because end up like uh, you have a reaction force again, and the reaction force is equal to the W plus uh, uh, verticals like uh, loading from the backfield. And then times the tangent uh, friction angle. So this is kind of like a, 
uh, the frictional force, right? Like the mu. So remember the uh, the Newton law. Uh, the the reaction force or the friction force will be equals to normal force times the coefficients of frictions, and the coefficient of frictions is equals to the tangents times the uh, uh, interface uh, frictional angles and the inter no, in, uh, the, uh, the interface frictional angles here is uh, delta B and then plus P sub P which is uh, the resistance force provided by the back uh, the embankment field so this is the resistance force uh, for the uh, granular soils and oftentimes you don't want to count on the maximum pass pressure because like the soil here um, adding there, so which is again just uh, the soil adding there. We don't count on like you know uh, it will be there uh, for the through the uh, lifespan of the uh, retaining wall. You know it, it will be good to be there. But like because of our weathering, you know, erosions, or maybe other like uh, constructions activities that like in the future, you never know. Like you know, would those soils still be intact or still in functions? You know, uh, it's not only like uh, it being excavated, but like if you have a crack or like you know less of uh, maintenance, and then you have uh, gaps uh, right there. Then end up like you know this is not full contact with the soil, so this is something that you want to want to count on, unless uh, you do uh, in purpose, uh, you know, uh, make, uh, you have uh, maintenance like uh, for this part of the soil for the wall, or it's part of the contract, part of the job, or like uh, you know in design, you know uh, this is a, this this will be an issue. So uh, you know, if an understanding that you make sure the 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 footings is deep enough. That like you know this piece of P will be uh, well maintained uh, in that regard. Then like you know stress in special case, then you can count on the piece of P uh, as the resistance force against sliding. But here uh, in in general design, like uh, we we don't count on this piece of P. So that would be the um, uh, the resistance force against sliding for uh, granular soils and for cohesive soil. It got a little bit more complicated uh, because um, you also take account into the uh, the force, the cohesions that at the base of the uh, footings. So for co uh, cohesive soils, uh, the resistance force, uh, the first part will still be the same. So the normal force times the uh, uh, frictions coefficients, which is the uh, tan, uh, tangent beta B. So this like uh, delta B right there is soil types dependence. Uh, we briefly talk about how to find the, the delta B uh, previously. So delta B, uh, we talk about it's uh, here. So uh, delta B is the uh, interactions uh, between soil and um, the uh, footing materials, uh, where likely is concrete uh, for most of the case. Um, per the NAFEX uh, 1986, the DM 7.02, uh, this uh, uh, delta B uh, values will be equals to uh, three over four times the soil friction angles. So if you have a clay uh, materials, the friction angles will be smaller, but you have co cohesions, right? Um, so you have. Uh, uh, smaller friction angles uh, than sand. Sand will be purely friction angles, but for clay, you will be have a uh, combinations uh, per the more Coulomb's uh, uh, characterization for the strings. You will be a combinations of both friction angles and uh, the cohesions. So that's why, like uh, the second part of it, uh, will be the cohesions. So <clears throat> first of all, like uh, if we have a shear lock. Uh, you realize like uh, it will be uh, two parts of our uh, of our foundation base. Uh, first, you have this part, 
right there. So this is the part that um, um, the soils will, the frictions will happen at the base right here. So it's kind of like a soil uh, against soil because you have an intact, uh, you have an intact base right there. So because uh, when you are being mobilized, the shear lock will mobilize uh, the soils, uh, soil block right here. So when you slide against it, it is the base of the soil, not the base of the concrete interacting with the uh, uh, foundation soils. <clears throat> so this part, we have the uh, cohesions times the uh, the distance right there, which is uh, A1, B here. So here's A1 and here's B, here, so pretty much is the, uh, the, the distance, what we call A1, B here. And the other part uh, of the uh, of the footings will be this part. So here, what's lying against the uh, foundation soils is the concrete inter interacting with the soils. So the cohesions here is concrete on soils. Uh, rather than like you know the purple part here is soil on soil, so it's just like a soil uh, reaction. So we use the cohesions of soil, but now here we need to use something else. Uh, this will be equals to C sub A, which what we what we call the uh, which defined in previous uh, slide again. So the C sub A is the adhesions concrete on soil. So yes, uh, so again. So it's just this part, the uh, adhesions concrete on soils. So this is belongs to uh, the interactions on uh, uh, concrete and soil, not soil uh, sliding against soil. So you have different num different values that uh, you need to look up uh, uh, from the design menu, and uh, you will be like uh, uh, we expect this cohesions will be uh you know it will be a number smaller than the pure soil cohesions so um this 10 p pi is equal to three four uh tangents of uh, three pi so this is per dm 7.02 if you have uh, other reference this may change uh <clears throat> and uh this phi pi here and also this cohesions like that, those are soil parameters that like uh, you should, uh, or the engineer should uh, uh, figure out uh, in step number two when we do the geotechnical explorations program, either by assembling the soil samples or doing SPT or CPT, uh, you know, those those should be found now C pi and phi, phi pi. And the C sub A right there, uh, will be you know you need to look up uh, some manuals on uh, how how and how like you know uh, the soil type that you are dealing with clay or silt or or sandy clay you know uh, how it uh, interact with concrete so that is the C sub A and uh, the dimensions of that will be equals to the width of the foundations minus uh, the previous part. And that last but not least, uh, you have a piece of P. And also like this piece of P is you only concede as uh, when you have a special case. So that is the uh, resistant force uh, against sliding uh, on cohesive soils uh, at the footing of a retaining wall. So uh, in summary, uh, for sliding, we uh, generally ignore P sub P at the uh, toe, unless you again, unless you have a special case, and also uh, we uh, ignore the live uh, low surcharge. So the surcharges will be like, you know, part of uh, the vertical loadings go into your uh, reaction force. If you have a permanent uh, surcharge, uh, 
Uh, but in general, it's like, you know, if you're not sure the surcharge, uh, well, the surcharge, right? Uh, will be there forever. You know, you don't want to count on it because the surcharge, like we'll be adding all uh, the additional loading to help uh, your retaining wall uh, against the uh, sliding because this is a force that pounding downward. Uh, but, you know, if you have a temporary load, you don't want to count on that you'll be dead for forever, especially for life flow. So in general, we don't consider that. And if for the case that uh, the sliding factor of safety is less than uh, 1.5, If it's just less than 1.5, then what alternative like uh, uh, we can do is like we increase the uh, the width of the foundations, or you, you use other design. Uh, you use like uh, inclined it. or uh, battery. More design, which have to uh, minimize the or, or increase the uh, vertical loading. If it still doesn't work, uh, the safer way or like you know uh, the more expensive way, which you know requires money, is install the foundations. Um, adding the uh, piles uh, at the base of the. Uh, of the uh, footings, um, the cheaper way to do it may be just add the shear key that we mentioned about here. If your uh, footing doesn't have, uh, don't have a, a shear key at the beginnings, then pretty much like the whole, the whole uh, uh, force of resistance will be uh, just, you just have the, uh, uh, the, the green part here of this formula, which is the adhesions between the concrete and um, and uh, and the soils. So if 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 no shear key, so shear key is a very popular choice uh, to against sliding because it's is relatively cheaper and it's effective. Uh, if no shear key, your resistance force against it will be equals to uh, the W plus P sub V tangents the friction angle, and then plus uh, the adhesions between the concrete and uh, and soils times B. Then you don't want to count on the P sub P. Well, the nice thing about the shear key is like, you know, we also ensure like you mobilize um, this, a part of the soils block right there. So like, you know, uh, you were having a higher cohesion because soil on soils, we have a higher cohesion than soil on concrete. So this is pretty, pretty smart design. But if the shear key still doesn't work, you know, somehow you have a sliding is uh, a huge concern for the site, then you need to go for the diff foundations, which will be much more expensive. And uh, last but, but, not least, uh, but, uh, but not least, uh you know, some trick is like uh, you may want to use a greater depth of your footing, but again, like the deeper you go, the more expensive it, it will be. So if you have a greater depth, then you get a better chance to allow the pass pressure uh, to against the sliding. Okay, so step number eight, uh, the global stability. Uh, so after checking all those like a local issue of the of your uh, foundation, oh, no, sorry, no foundation, but like uh, your retaining wall, uh, like, you know, those local issue like overturning, sliding, uh, bearing capacity, uh, failure. Um, now, like, you know, it's, uh, before we like, you know, approve uh, the uh, stability, uh, you know, we need to look at the big picture because uh, this is like uh, shallow foundations in some sense. Uh, you need to ensure that um, the overall, like the uh, the uh, stability globally, 
uh, is stable. And seems like uh, very likely we have a cut because uh, uh, like you always kind of like uh, uh, have a uh, uh, upper grade because uh, there's a backfill, and then also you have a lower grade because uh, like you know you have the uh, you know the the cut. Uh, such that, like you know, uh, the wall will, will distinguish the upper sides and lower side. So you kind of like creating a slope. So you you become like a, a global issue in the sense of like a slope uh, stability analysis that you need to perform. And um, you know, like uh, we talk about it in uh, five six six zero. So again, like this class is supposed to be almost like uh, the last uh, dual tech class that you the most complicated 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 like a class that you can you can have uh, in school in grad school uh, not even just uh you know uh undergrad uh, but both undergrad and graduate uh you know the, this is like uh, the last geotech design class so you would expect that we come across with a lot of different topics uh both in undergrad and also grad so in uh, 566 uh, soil mechanics we talk about slope stability so pretty much like now this this is back to slope stability and um you know uh, you need to search through the uh criticals like a slip surface uh you could be a, a you could be like a deep failure or you could be a shallow failures uh totally like uh, based on what type of soils you work on so the the nature will will find the weakest plane uh, uh possible when you're low on it so whenever like you know the the weakest locations could be deep, could be shallows, based on the soil that you have, then you know you fail the way that it is. And if you have more like a homogeneous soils, um then you will fail like a, a circular patterns. So you have a radar, so you have a shallows or or deep foundations, um, especially have some some soft materials, uh you know, homogeneous soft materials, you'll be amazed like you know how how circular uh, the the failure slip surface would be, and you but if you have some like a weak seam, so for example, if you have a, a kind of like a weak seam here, and sometimes you know you may fail as a wedge because that's the uh, the weak seam is forcing the soil fail that way, so uh, be careful. And uh, we have talked about this in 566, and uh, this, this class is uh, not uh, covering slope stability, so we don't spend too much time on it. But if you recall that, uh, uh, if you have a circular uh, uh, slip surface, there's a different method that uh, you can use, uh, like the Swedish circles. So those, this is uh, more symbols, uh, the Swedish circles, um, which is non, not those like a uh, method slide method. So pretty much like a, a equilibrium, false equilibrium method, the uh, Swedish circles. But the key is you need to identify the uh, 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 the criticals like a slip surface. Uh, you can do that by like a uh, menu uh, menu method. There's some uh, uh, method that possible for you to search for the uh, critical slip surface. Or uh, more commonly, commonly nowadays is uh, search through uh, uh, software uh, like U Texas or uh, uh, Geo Studios or even Flag. You have a free versions of a slope stability uh, analysis. You know those those will be quite handy finding uh, or solving a uh, uh, slope stability, stability problems. So other like you know computational uh, method like the OMS uh, ordinary method of slide. Or the Bishop method or the Spencer method. So we talk about we cover all this in CE five six six zero, or you can crack a, a slope stability uh, manual textbook. He will show you the procedure how to do that. And for uh, long circular uh, failure uh, surface, well, likely you know you have a weak slim. Uh, slim.
and it's very important uh, to catch it because like uh, at the end of the day you don't know what dictate uh, the failure mechanisms could be global could be local but if you have a weak simp like you know nearby your uh, your footings uh, base then very likely uh, that weak sim will overtake uh, the uh, the your design, you know, you know, end up like you you could have a very high factor of safety over for other stuff like for, uh, uh, overturning, sliding, you know, or bearing capacity. Uh, if you are not catching the risk simp, you'll be very dangerous because like everything, you know, just slide through the uh, uh, weak sim, like you know this uh, wedge failure here. Um, so it's very important to to catch this in. Uh, in your geotech explorations program so is always go back to the basic uh, geotech uh, investigations so you know whether like you know you have enough ball holes you have for a contractor that you trust or that you can rely on that do the job you know able to do a good cpt uh, uh, or spt to catch or spt will be hard to catch with simp but cpt maybe you have a good chance uh, but also this argument that like uh, CPT uh, cannot do a good job on catching like a uh, thin layers, uh, but like the, the more advanced uh, CPT techniques may be able to do it. So be very careful uh, on this, uh, 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 you know, when you design for retaining walls, always uh, look for the surprise. So this group, the weak seam that you have, you know, you could be a layer of organic matters, you know, that will be a very, very dangerous so it's really look to be uh, uh relied on and the uh f um uh hw uh a the federal highway agency required that the global stability have a factor of safety of at least uh, 1.5 so you if you happens that like uh uh factor of safety less than 1.5 some alternative you can do first you may you can think of like using a uh, deep foundations at this picture showing here so you know if you have a weak sim layer right there then your deep foundations or so like like a couple of weak seams layer right there the diff uh your 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 deep foundations can bypass uh, the weak soil layers and ensure like you know the low gut transfer to like a firm ground right there, but you won't be cheap on those like uh you know uh, deep foundations. Uh, you may want to find the the, uh, the alternative of uh, doing ground improvement if uh if this is cheaper that way. Sometimes you know ground improvement can be very expensive too. Or like you know, uh, alternative is using like a lightweight backfill. So the loading now will be uh, reduced if you can use like a lightweight uh, backfill materials. And you know, you may want even like I want to change the uh, the wall type. Uh, you know, instead of like a simple. Uh, a cantilever wall then you may want to use like uh, some anchor so soldier piles or you know use some like a uh, lacking wall uh, piles or some uh, buttons like a uh, uh, wall type uh, to help you to uh, to to increase to improve the global stability okay so for the uh, factor of safety um, for bearing capacity uh, when you have a deep foundations attached to uh, cast in place uh, gravity walls, so the factor of safety. Well, again, this is not the global stability, uh, but this is uh, uh, bearing capacity. So you have a deep foundations with uh, the Graph gravity wall. The factor of safety of that would be equals to five times the cohesion of the soils divided by the unit weight of soils times uh, the the the, the, um, 
the length of the piles plus uh, the surcharge and uh, the so this is five uh, the federal highway authorities require that this is greater than 2.0 Well, in that next, uh, last but not least, uh, for the string gauge, uh, this is the last steps are designed. So, you know, uh, at this point, uh, remember, like, you know, we talk about all this design steps, you know, uh, start from the beginning, uh, understanding the project, setting up the criteria, and then now the geotech explorations kicks in. So you uh, generate the geotech profile for the site and also uh, to get the, uh, field data and lab data for the uh, subgrade soils underneath your uh, footings so you know you have the cbt spt lab testing to come up with the unit weight of the soils and also the friction angles of the soils cohesions of the soils uh, we have all have seen that they are required uh, for your uh, later on uh, designs uh when you like you look at the uh for example like step six seven eight you look at the bearing capacity the overturning sliding and also the overall stability uh, so you set you up, up to uh to look at all those issues and when you look at those issues you start with uh uh initial base dimensions and you keep fine-tuning uh the dimensions of the of the gravity walls and also it's the same as like uh uh, change the wall type as needed you know if, if you feel like uh, the traditionals like cast in place kind of like a ca uh, cantilever type of uh, uh, a wall doesn't work then like you know if you for example the shearing uh, no, sorry not the sliding is becomes an issue you may want to add the shear lock and if the shear lock even doesn't work then you may need to go to your deep foundations uh, piles connect to your uh, to your uh, the foundations and also you can play uh, so that the, the, the piles connect to the footing of your uh, retaining wall you can also play with the dimensions uh, to just adjust the base width uh, uh, you know if uh, if you can and also uh, maybe like adjust the, the backfill materials or unit weights you know you you may find like a, a lighter weight gravel <coughs> then like, you know uh, uh, on site, uh, maybe like you know, uh, material that has a lot of fines, then it helps you to decrease the uh, overall unit weight. Uh, so, from kind of like from step four to step uh, nine, so step nine is also like look at the uh, settlements. Is it, it kind of like an iterative like a process? Uh, if, if, it does, if this doesn't work, then you may need to go back to. You know, for example, if uh, you find out the overturning moment is, is less than the requirement for the project, then you may need to go back to step number four, uh, change like uh, some uh, geometry uh, of the wall or like graphic materials, and then, you know, check all uh, 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 requirements again. So uh, as, at, at a point that like, uh, you know, your, uh, your design fulfill all the checkbox and uh, you know the uh the, the dimensions that you design the backfill material come with it the type of the wall that come with it that fulfilling uh all the requirement from step five to step nine then like uh, at the end uh it will be uh for you to design for the design drinkage systems so what you need is like uh you need to uh make sure like uh uh stay away from stay away from water you know water water and water uh, as much as possible unless you have a very special job you know but perhaps it's a retaining wall for a reservoir or like you know uh so some very special reasons that you need to uh keep the ground or keep keep it like your back feel saturated you know uh Unless you have a very valid uh, project specific uh, reason to do that, otherwise, like the backfill materials, you want it as dry as possible. Uh, it, it could be like have a rainfall, you could be have a flooded event or whatever. You want to the water like you know being drained uh, as soon as possible, uh, such that you want to develop a drinkage systems. So what the what the drinkage system will do 
So you have a drinkage system that can prevent the accumulations of water, you know, and also the accumulations of water will destabilize. Destabilizing uh, hydraulic hy uh, hydrostatic pressure. Because uh, back to the uh, previous lecture, when we talk about the uh, earth pressure distributions, whenever you have water pressure, uh, hydrostatic pressure, you will add uh, the amount of loading to your wall, and you want you really want to stay away from that. So. Uh, so you want to provide like a, a backfill drain cage uh, that the water will go away. So part of the reason that uh, your backfill material is always preferred to be a granular materials, which can uh, drain water much faster and better than clay. Clay is bad, you know, for retaining water design. Unless like you know, again, you have a specific reasons for that for for your project. You know, you don't don't use like a clay material backfill, and uh, the again like uh, uh, the federal highway uh, agency has a has a requirement that uh, the backfill material need to be uh, less than fifteen percent fines. So you know, uh, if you have fines, a little bit of it on site is fine, but make sure like you know you only uh, uh, being a small portions of uh, your field overall. And um and also we have a philosophy that like for retaining wall design is uh, providing the backfield drainage is much better than uh, design a wall that can uh, sustain hydrostatic pressure. You know, for the case that like you know you 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 need uh, the soil saturated behind uh, the wall. Uh, that case like you know which means you need to have a stronger uh uh you know uh, like a larger wall or like you know a thicker wall or uh, like you know higher dimensions or like a longer width uh, you know whatever it takes or maybe end up you need to have a coupling with uh, deep foundations to resist the additional like hydrostatic pressure because the uh the higher the taller the wall you go uh, the hydrostatic pressure will build up uh, quite significantly so uh, the design philosophy here is now is like a you want to provide like a backfield drainage rather than like you know uh, design for the uh, uh, anticipated uh, hydrostatic pressure. So which means like you know uh, having like a uh, uh, drainage systems will be very uh, important uh, for retaining water design. So you could have a lot of like a uh, uh, drainage aggregates. Uh, make sure the water goes away, and then you also need to control the water one off uh, at the uh, surface. And uh, Whipple is great, you know, if you go to like a, a more like a hillside uh, country where you have a lot of like a retaining wall, it's kind of weird to find like, a, you know, at the uh, United States because so uh, spacious, like, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's relatively flat uh, for this country. But if you go to some Asia country like Japan, like you know, expensive uh, uh, places like Hong Kong, uh, you will realize that they have a lot of like retaining wall and drinkage is is important, important, important uh, for retaining wall designs. And you will see a lot of like uh, those like uh, ripples uh, comes out from the walls. Like those are for the drinkage issue, and some of them even have like a uh, ripples at different elevations uh, to to uh, increase. Uh, the water uh, migration. So you know, if this is the fun phase of the wall, you will see uh, occasionally some walls have holes, two gauge holes come out of it. Those are the whip holes that go further back uh, your backfill, uh, keep collecting water, uh, or keep like you know, uh, make sure water uh, trough uh, uh, get rid of the waters like uh, from the backfill materials. So those design essentials and um, and uh, uh, your project also should uh, 
spells out like uh, what kind of like uh, uh, flooding or wing for events uh, that it designed for. Uh, some extreme cases, uh, you have intensive wing for, uh, you know, uh, like uh, 24 hours, uh, you know, your wall can handle, for example, your your retaining wall can handle an extreme events of uh, maybe uh, six millimeters of uh, water uh, within a 24 hours uh, uh, waiting interval. So. Or like you know, uh, if you are working on a uh, 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 near shore, uh, your your retaining wall maybe can like design for to withstand uh, twenty five uh, years uh, storm events. You know those kind of uh, uh, weak risk based or performance based uh, uh, analysis is uh, quite popular nowadays, uh, even for uh, retaining wall designs. Okay, so let's do a, um, a design example here. Uh, the simple uh, cantilever uh, gravity wall that uh, finding on soils that has a unit weight of 18 Q Newton per meter grip, a uh, uh, friction angle of 36 degree. So you only have like a friction angle, so uh, it's finding on sand materials. And the backfill materials, um, is uh, same unit weight but with a friction angle of 30 degree. Um, the wall is uh, uh, the the um, the stern part uh, is 5.5 uh, meter tall with a width uh, with a initial uh, dimensions of foundations uh, or like the footing width of uh, four meters. Um, so again, this is only the uh, initial dimensions. So we need to check. Uh, through all the criteria like the uh, overturning, sliding, you know, uh, bearing capacity, all those good things, uh, and then like uh, we will find out, uh, we confirm whether this dimensions uh, is appropriate. Um, this is a concrete uh, retaining wall with a concrete unit weight of twenty three kilo newtons per meter grip. Uh, it is you have a sloping ground, uh, sloping backfill right there with a sloping angle of. Uh, uh, 10 degrees and um, these um, the soils and uh, a wall phase uh, interactions is 10 degree right there so pretty much this is the um, in the uh, the uh, the friction angle between soils and concrete phase um, so the vertical phase not the uh, horizontal uh, the foundation uh, the horizontal foundation phase so this is only for the backfill and the uh, concrete wall. So that is the basic geometry of the of the of of this uh, of this job. And uh, let's uh, go through the steps and see whether, like you know, uh, this design works or not. So first, the very first step we do is to find the uh, total height. Of soil that exerting uh, pressure to the retaining wall. So um, the total height here will be because um, the wall footing stop there. So we're looking at this backfill is part of the wall. So we want to find out this total height there. And this total height would equals to, um, well, actually is to the base of it. So this is part of the wall. So be, uh, from bottom to top, it will be 0.7 meters plus 5.5 uh, meters plus uh, the tiny bit here. That's the final part here. So that's like a three part of it. That part would be equals to 2.6 me meters times the tangent 10 degree. So pretty much just this little part right here. And which gives us a total height of 6.6 .6 meters. Next, uh, yes, we find the uh, 
Ka, the active fair earth pressure. And we are using Coulomb here. Um, based on the geometry, since this is a 90 degree wall, so alpha equals 90 degree, um, the friction angles for a backfill material is like a 30 degree. So because we are uh, dealing with Ka, pretty much like the loading here. So we are working on the backfill, not working on the foundation soil. So that's why the friction angle is 30 degree. The uh, friction angles between the backfill and the wall face is 10 degree. And the sloping ground is a, nine, is a 10 degree. So if we plug all this back to our uh, quantum formula, uh, the general formulas that we derived uh, in last lecture, we put into the formula and Ka would equals to the following. Well, actually, this is the formula. So if, we, <coughs> if we're packing like uh, all those angles into the formulas, we get Ka equals to 0 0.35. The, um, the active uh, earth pressure coefficients. And then uh, step number three, we'll be finding The loading actually uh, per meter adding on the um, the wall phase. So pretty much we want to find out the PA and pH, the horizontals, and also the verticals components of the uh, force adding on the wall. So we know the PA will be equals to the one half. Ka, we just find unit weight of soils on the height square. So um, the force equals to one thirty nine uh, times seven point seventy two kilo newton per meters. And the horizontal component, which is this force here, will be equals to, oops, on the very half times the cosine. Uh, Uh, angle to interface angles. This will equal 137.6 kilo newton per meters. And the vertical direction loading uh, from the back field to the wall will be equal to the sine angle, sine interface angle, will be equal to 24.3. Kino Newton meters. Again, the angle is 10 degree. So the whole, this is your horizontal loading, and this is your vertical loading. Oops, that'll be hard to see. So this will be your uh, vertical loading. Next, what we will do is uh, to calculate the moment at the toe. And uh, we had identify like uh, that the moment here, point A at the toe. And we take moments uh, to that point uh, based on the force that we have. So that's where we step number four. So we look at the weight and moment. At point A. So we have different area identified uh, from our design. So uh, the stern part, uh, the little triangle part right there, um, also the footing part, and the fourth part will be the uh, 
uh, the majority of the backfield that has the rectangular shape and a little triangular shape uh, up there uh, for our backfield because we have a sloping ground. So uh, those are the five area and each areas uh, we can um, based on the areas times the um, times the uh, unit weight. You know we have concrete or the soils. So concrete is twenty three. Uh, kilonewtons per meter grip times the area, then we get kilonewtons per meters. So the per meters here, you know, same as the force we cal calculate uh, previously, like, you know, because uh, uh, th this is a, supposed to be a 3D structures that goes continuously uh, into and out of the page. But now we simplify into our 2D problems, so we can do it on piece of a paper. So we are dealing with uh, 2D dimensions that are uh, with a unit uh, dimensions that go into and go, go out of the page. So that's why it's per one meters. So the concrete, uh, which is for the area one, two, and three, so just geometry, uh, you know, triangles or rectangles, calculate the weight. Uh, so it should be simple enough. And uh, the 18 right there is the unit weight of the soils. And then based on the geometry, uh, we will find out uh, the weight of uh, each area or each like uh, components and we add them up, then we get the total weight of the whole thing. And then each uh, each area, then like, you know, you can find out the center of, uh, you know, the center point of it. Um, and based on that, uh, you know, the center of the triangle center or the, uh, the center of the uh, center of, of uh, rectangles, then, uh, uh, we take moment uh, of uh, from point A, so we know the centroid. Then we know like the horizontal or vertical distance from um, moment uh, from the uh, point A. Then we can find the moment arm, and we know the weight times the moment arm. Then we got the moment. So that's how we got. And at the end of the day, uh, all this weight over here is kind of like you know a. Uh, 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 right hand side or providing a cut wide rotations with respect to point A. So um, here we take the moment and we say cut wise is positive at this point. So this those are kind of like the resisting moments. So realize like all this weight over here is uh, helping uh, the uh, the structure to be stabilized. So that's we got the uh, positive moment at that point. So here is a step number four. We finish all this, this like uh, uh, calculations for the uh, rates and also for the moment. And starting from step five now, so we look at the details. So uh, look at the sliding. And uh, from the previous like a slide, uh, we mentioned the uh, the equations. Um, for finding the force for sliding uh, in granular materials. So we talked about this uh, previously, the sliding for the uh, granular soils, you know, you can go back to that. Uh, the resistant force uh, to against the sliding is, 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 is that formula there. So if we use that formula uh, to apply here, and uh, the factor of safety will be equals to the force resist sliding divided by uh, the force driving. And the force driving on that will be equal to the uh, horizontal loading from the backfield. So <clears throat> pretty much like uh, this force here is driving the piece of edge is driving the um, is driving the wall to slide this way, right? So this horizontal force. So that is the driving force and the resistant force is uh, what we talked about previously um, on the previous slides. So the uh, resistant force, the formula is uh, the vertical weight plus um, the vertical loading times the coefficients of frictions, which is tangents, uh, interface uh, interface uh, angle between um, the concrete and the soil. But this one, yes, 
talking about the uh, regular material, and this is the footings. So this angles at the base is different from the uh, the angles uh, we talked about previously. The the in the the friction angles, like you know, at the vertical phase, which is ten degree. So this ten degree belongs to the interactions between back field and the vertical wall. But now we are talking about the uh, the interactions at the bottoms. So the orientation is different. The sliding motions is different. Uh, a different confining stress. So you expect a very different friction angles. So now we we are looking at the uh, friction angle at the bottom. So we mentioned about how to find out this uh, delta sub b. And uh, now if you plug in the numbers, uh, the weight that we find out total vertical weight we find out previously is four eight from uh, what we calculated in the previous table. Here Newton parameters and the piece that we we figured already uh, the vertical loading uh, from the back field. Using the cooler method, finding the Ka that we got the vertical loading uh, from the backfill, which is uh, 24.3. And then now it's the tangent uh, interface angle, uh, which is 3 over 4 of the friction angles of the foundation soil, which is 36 degrees. Because now we are looking at the bottom, not looking at, uh, not looking at the top. Uh, I mean, like uh, the backfield material. We're looking at the foundation soils. The sliding occur at the bottoms, and then derived by the driving force, which is the horizontal components, which is one thirty-seven point six kilo newton per meters. So we plug in all those numbers, we calculate our effect of safety is equal to 1.6, which is just greater than uh, the, the, uh, the federal highway uh, agency requirements of 1.5. So we are okay on that one. So if this doesn't work out, if you find out something like you know one point uh, factor of safety end up will be something less than one point five, you know one point zero, one point one, or point nine, then like uh, uh, which means like we need to if that happens, then we that means we need to go back to uh, change our design, to, uh, either change the dimensions, or the width, uh, also like uh, you know or maybe change uh, uh, find some materials that like with a lesser yielding weight, so you will decrease. Uh, the weight, you know, so that, you know, what you need to uh, uh, design for. So you will be an iterative process, progress. And um, and uh, if, like, you know, if I do this design, if my factor, safe, factor safety is way below what is required, if I got a factor safety of 0.1 or 0.2, you know, which is maybe even like a 0.4, which is telling me, like, I even need to uh, make more uh, dramatic change, maybe even change uh, the type of uh, footing uh, that I need to design for, add the different foundations if, uh, if it is necessary. So the next, we go to step six. What we do is like uh, find the overturning. Calculate the, uh, check the uh, overturnings like uh, uh, fact of safety and the fact of safety of the turnings is equals to the moment that we cease the turning you are by the moment driving the turning <coughs> and the moment of uh, resistance is equals to the moment of the weight which what we calculate from the table right there because those the weight of the retaining wall is uh, the source to uh, resist the uh, the overturning. Because when when this um, turns, you will try to turn at point A, right? Uh, overturning means like you know uh, the loading from backfield forcing um, the wall like kind of like hinging at point A to rotate this way. So this is the overturning that uh, we are designed for. So we try to uh, find out the factor of safety for that. And the driving force, 
will be um, the two that uh, form the backfield loading. So the piece of A and the piece of V. So the driving moments will be the moments of the horizontal, uh, the moment from the horizontal loading, that is the driver. And if we take the moment there, right, uh, the horizontal loading, which pretty much is, the, is uh, in the anti-clockwise directions. So this force pretty much is in the anti-clockwise directions. So this is the piece of uh, piece of H, and the piece of V here is in the clockwise directions, which is positive. So one more time, it's like uh, you have we have the uh, horizontal loading here, horizontal loading here. The piece of H goes anti-clockwise, and the vertical loading here go clockwise. So, which is uh, in the same directions with the uh, with the moment. So, so that's uh, in the resistant moment. So that's why our vertical moment will be in a vertical, you know, in the negative uh, directions. So again, in terms of uh, driving, right? In terms of driving, uh, the anti-clockwise is positive. So here, anti-clockwise is positive in the driving, and the clockwise is negative. But when when we are in the resisting moment, uh, the clockwise is positive. So be very very clear. Uh, know what you're doing uh, in terms of the polarity. So figure all those out. You will you know make your design much much clear. Uh, you know, less error and less trouble later. And the moments. Of the horizontal loading will be equals to the horizontal force times the um, moment arm. So uh, we are talking about this. Um, we are talking about this height here. We're talking about this height that will be equals to our. One third of the total height, so there will be six point six six divided by three. Because you got like a, you know, the location of this like a loading, you got uh, you know, go back to the uh, distributions, right? The uh, the stress distributions. It's a dry materials. You don't have the water pressure, so it's only a triangular uh, shape, and the center happen at the one third. Of the uh, total height, so that is the uh, driving moments for the horizontal loading, and this is the moment arm, and for the vertical loading, which is here to here, so the moment arm here is uh, four meters, pretty much is the base of your uh, of your footing. So this is. Uh, well, so this will be the vertical loading moment will be equals to the uh, vertical force times y, and this is four meters. And here is six point six six meter divided by three. So that's what we got uh, for the moments. And right now, if we plug in the numbers, uh, the factor of safety. We equals to the total resisting moments. Again, we calculate uh, from the, the previous table, which is 940 divided by 9, uh, sorry, the 940.9 kilo newtons uh, times meter per meters divided by, uh, uh, we plug in the numbers, we know the PAH and the PAV. Uh, we calculate previously from heat from there and from, uh, from the two. Uh, we pack in those number now it's one thirty seven point six kilo newtons per meters times the moment arm is two point two two meters and then minus so the uh, horizontal loading is twenty four point three kilo newtons per meters uh, times the moment arm corresponding moment arm is four meters so we do all that 
the factor of safety for overturning is uh, 4.5, which is uh, significantly greater than the requirements of 2.0. So I, uh, you know, we should feel safe in terms of overturning. Sliding maybe uh, you know is a little bit close to the uh, you know the threshold requirement, so there's a little bit concern over there. If if like a one doesn't feel comfortable, it's totally understandable that maybe like a uh, 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 need to design for add a shear lock, uh, you know to to bring up the factor of safety. Oh, but like for fact, oh, we are working on the uh, um. <clears throat> The overturnings, so uh, we still need to check the uh, eccentricity. So let's leave that like uh, at the next steps. Uh, we will do that when we do the uh, bearing capacity. So the next steps is the uh, bearing capacities. So first, we need to find the resultant distance um, when we do our, our bearing capacity. So what is the resultant distance? Is again like uh, when we have the uh, at the base rate, uh, there's a reaction force that going toward the uh, the toe of the uh, of the footings and the dimensions right there. So this directions or this dimensions right there here is what we call the um, the resultants like a uh, force uh, locations. So I can call this to be the the D distance, and this part right there is the uh, eccentricity that we want to find out, and we want to check the locations. And when we talk about like overturning, so we mentioned about this uh, sort of requirements on this uh, eccentricity, we need to check. So again, like uh, we try to find out the uh, the D here first. How far this resultant force is away from the uh, uh, the moment point A. Okay, so now we try to find D, and what we do is take moment at point A, and then uh, take clockwise to be positive. So uh, summations at uh, point A at equilibrium uh, would be equal to zeros. And um, the first force that we have is the resultant force. So it's going to uh, uh, anti-clockwise, so uh, it's negative uh, to the point A. Um, <clears throat> so negative normal force times the distance. And then we have the vertical uh, loading from the back field at a distant Y. And then uh, this is like a cut Y directions, right? Is uh, we are talking about this loading to point A is cut wise. And the other uh, horizontal loading back field will be anti cut wise as the moment arm of uh, X. So this will be equals to P. A H times X right there is equal to zero. So we, uh, well, this is all the three forces, and uh, we looking at this like uh, uh, to the uh, to the moments uh, point A, and this force here, the reaction force. If we like, uh, take the uh, equilibriums of summations like F Y, and uh, positive is pointing up. Uh, we have realized this um, the reaction force is equals to the rate plus the uh, vertical loading right there. So uh, we know the rate, we know the uh, uh, vertical loading. So it should be consistent on the uh, 
the notations. So we know this uh, pretty much like uh, we can find out n and then substitute back to the, these pure, uh, star equations. And then uh, we know this, we know why, you know, we talk about those already, we can solve for d. So d will be equals to 1.69 meters. So the next is pretty much just like uh, kind of like tracking the uh, eccentricity. So it's part of the, uh, uh, for the overturning uh, requirements. So we know, so this is our foundations. This is the center line. Um, this is the loading. And now we know this is, uh, we just calculate this 1.69 meters. So this is point A, right? And then uh, we know like uh, the whole foundation is four meters, which means half of them is two meters. So this part will be equals to two meters minus 1.69 meters, which is equals to 0 0.31 meters. And um, this is the eccentricities that we want to calculate. And, um, and this is less than the requirements, uh, one sixth of the, uh, of the uh, uh, width of the foundations. Um, because this is equals to uh, four divided by six equals to 0 0.67. So we are good. So it's okay. And next, we will check the uh, the find the bearing pressure. So, back from the uh, beginning of this uh, lecture, we introduced like a uh, briefly how to find out the bearing pressure with this formula here, which this formula is also we have learned it in uh, C four six thousand. Uh, our, our shallow foundation design because pretty much this footing part is like our shallow foundations and we plug in the numbers there so the bearing pressure the q max could be equals to the uh, vertical force divided by the foundation width so these are continuous like uh, footings so just divided by the width and uh, six e eccentricity divided by the width uh, the formula right there. So pretty much this is uh, summations F we equals to N equals to the weight, uh, all the weight uh, for the uh, retaining wall structure plus the uh, loading from the uh, vertical loading from the backfill. So we, <coughs> so this number is known, which is equals to 432.9 kilonewtons per meters. Because uh, uh, again, like uh, we know the weight, right? The weight is uh, uh, 48, and then like a uh, pass uh, PAV is 24.3. So some of them is equals to 432.9, and the width of foundation is uh, 4 meters, and 1 plus 6. The eccentricities we calculate is. Uh, 0.31 right there, and then divide by the width of the foundation, which is four meters. So we do all this. Our Q max will be equals to 158 kilo newtons per meter square. So what does it mean? Is like uh, we calculate uh, this is the retaining wall, and this is the distributed stress. Oops, this should be pointing down. So it's just the distributed stress. Um, it is a non-uniform uh, stress, and uh, you will be have a uh, higher stress at the toe side. So here, the stress here is like the Q max that we just calculate, and we can all, all also calculate the Q mean, but we will use the Q max for design uh, when I calculate the factor of safety uh, for uh, bearing uh, capacity failure. So next is that uh, we will try to find out the uh, uh, bearing capacity.
So uh, because we have an eccentric loading and also like you know have an inclined loading from the back field, so we cannot use the Tosaki, but we can use the uh, rustic uh, method. And I'm not going to uh, spend too much time over here because this is, uh, belongs to the subject in C467. So if we use the uh, rustic formulas, uh, we will get the uh, the bearing capacity. So this is the bearing capacity equals to uh, one or one seven. So you're uh, finding on like a the sand, so the bearing capacity shouldn't be a concern. Um, so this is what we got. So here again, this is like a C four six seven. I don't know. Repeat. Repeat there. But anyways, like you know, uh, again, this this course is a lot, very last uh, geotech design course. So we mean to be have uh, uh, you know uh, many concept now put together uh, to do real geotech design. Uh, retaining retaining wall design is always a very classic uh, geotech design that like uh, you know uh, a lot of uh, geotechnic technical technical engineers uh, daily work uh, based on. So it's kind of like a package of uh, throughout the whole geotech uh, academic career, you know, to do a retaining wall design. So uh, you get this number, and uh, for this class, I don't really, because I know some of you like, you know, maybe have taken this class, like uh, the foundation class a long time ago, or like, you know, uh, maybe one or two of you, like even haven't uh, took that class. Uh, but anyway, it's like, uh, you know, uh, in exams, when it asks to ask you to find the, uh, the effect of safety for bearing capacity uh, for your wall design, you know, I, I will give you the uh, bearing capacity. So uh, we have, you know, provide, provided that, uh, like, this is for exams and I have an understanding that, like, uh, the, this class is not a shroud foundation design class. This is a retaining wall design class. But anyways, like, uh, now we can check the effect of safety for the bearing pressure, which is, it goes to the bearing capacity from the soil. So this is the soil part divided by the bearing pressure. So which is, this is the loading part of, uh, from the wall. Then we put in those number 1.17 divided by 1.58. You get six point four four. So again, like you know, we have like a a dense sense with a friction angle of thirty six degree. You know, very likely the bearing capacity is not a concern. So this is way greater than the requirement of three point zero. It's okay. So we finished like step number eight, and a step number nine will be settlement analysis. And again, uh, this. Our course is now focused on settlements uh, calculations. We learned settlement calculations in C366, and we spent uh, quite a bit of time to talk about that kind of solve behavior in uh, C566. So I'm not going to uh, go through the settlement calculations, but that's what you should do uh, uh, also for the defensive settlements uh, in uh, step number nine. And then step number 10 will be designed for the drain cage. But at least, like you know, this given ideas, like uh, the examples given ideas on how the uh, design process like for uh, retaining.